a Sunday school teacher asked his students to bring in a plastic egg for Resurrection Sunday. They were to place inside the egg something that spoke to the real meaning of Easter. And so the students all brought their eggs in on that designated Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, and they were so excited for the teacher to open up their egg and to give an object lesson on the spot about the resurrection of Christ. The first child, it was a little girl, she stepped forward and she presented her egg and the teacher opened it up and inside there was a flower. And a teacher spoke about the new life that we have in Christ because of the resurrection. The next egg had a, a crayon drawn picture of Jesus and the teacher explained that it is only Jesus who rose from the dead. The next one had a little nail inside of his plastic egg and a teacher spoke about how Jesus was nailed to the cross, but then when he was alive again, all that was left were the nail prints in his hand. And then the next one had a little pebble in his egg, and a teacher explained how the stone was rolled away from the tomb, and everyone could see it was empty because Jesus was risen from the dead. The last child was Brian. Brian, seven years old, intellectually impaired, not very well liked by the other kids. They kind of kept their distance from him. But Brian was excited and he brought up his plastic egg and he handed it to the teacher and the teacher opened it up and was dumbfounded because there was nothing in it. While the teacher was trying to gather his wits and come up with something to say, Brian said it for him. The egg is empty because the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen from the dead. Brian got it, didn't he? Ironic, isn't it? That an intellectually impaired child would be the one that understood the resurrection so clearly. The story of Jesus is full of ironies. In our previous message, we spoke about the ironies, the seven ironies of the cross. And it's not surprising that there would be so much that is ironic about Jesus his incarnation was ironic, wasn't it? Fully God, yet also fully human. How could it be? An irony, and yet so true. And then as he began his earthly ministry, and he was at once loved and hated. An irony. And even at the cross, as he was nailed there and he hung between heaven and earth and irony, the grandest irony in all of human history was taken place because the holy God became sin, utter sin for us. What an irony, but necessary for redemption. Today is Resurrection Sunday. What irony is there about the resurrection? There's none. There is no irony. There is only certainty with the resurrection. And so today we want to highlight from Colossians chapter 2, seven certainties of the empty tomb. Let's pray. Our Father, with rejoicing, we come to you today and we want to serve you. We want to be your children. We want to please you for you have triumphed over sin and death and hell and we have these certainties. May our hearts overflow with gratitude to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 17. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 17. The seven glories of the empty tomb. Glory number one. There's no more doubt. There is no more doubt. Now you've heard it said that the only thing certain in life is death and taxes. No, there's one more. There's one more that is even more certain. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is certain. Now, I know that there are critics, some of whom may even write in the paper today disputing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They have no leg to stand on. The evidence is overwhelming. Jesus was raised from the dead and he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. Eyewitnesses. Not a possibility they were hallucinating because there were 500 of them. Some say, 
Oh, the disciples must have stolen the body. Really? Would that make sense? What happened to the disciples when Jesus was arrested? They all ran for their lives. Where, where were the disciples when Jesus was put on the cross? Well, Peter denied him just before he was nailed to the cross. The others all ran and hid except for John. He was the only one there. So what would transform those, those cowardly men into courageous titans who would preach the resurrection of Christ even to their martyrdom? There's only one explanation. The resurrection is true. That's what changed it. I think about the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was a Jewish feast held every year, 50 days after Passover. So the, the crucifixion of Christ was still a recent event. It was a current event. 50 days later, people still are buzzing about it. A whole bunch of pilgrims come into Jerusalem at that time. The city is overflowing. And Peter stands up in front of those thousands and thousands and thousands of unbelievers, skeptical people, and he declares to them that Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, if what he was telling them was a lie, how difficult would it have been to discredit his message? The tomb was right there in Jerusalem. Just go to the tomb and show that it's occupied. But no one could do that because everyone knew it was empty. Jesus was alive. And that day, 3,000 men came to faith in Jesus Christ. And after that, thousands and thousands more. And continuing to this day, some 2,000 years later, there are churches all over this world who are rejoicing in Jesus Christ today because he is alive. There's no more doubt. Now, I've spoken from history. What we really need to hear from is the Bible. The Bible is authoritative. And our text tells us there's no more doubt. There's no more doubt about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Lord. Our text, chapter 2, verse 9 of Colossians. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I want you to note that this is in the present tense. It is not in the past tense as something that happened in the past and is no more. This is in the present tense that in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the living Lord. C.S. Lewis observed it this way. He said, when it comes to Jesus, there are only three possible conclusions a person can make. Either he is a liar or he is a lunatic, or he is the Lord of heaven and earth. If Jesus said the things he did, and he did, Jesus claimed to be God. He said before Abraham was, I am. He said that he would be crucified. He said this multiple times. I'll be crucified, and on the third day I will rise again. He said that over and over again. For someone to say what Jesus said, and, and know that what they're saying is is false? That person's a liar. If Jesus knew in saying those things they were false, he was a liar. But if Jesus didn't know they were false when in fact they were, he'd be a lunatic. But if Jesus said those things and he said those fully believing this is the truth, I'm, I'm telling it as it is, and it turned out to be true, well then, he is the Lord. And he is the Lord. For the tomb is empty. There is no doubt about it. And because he is the Lord, then the message he gave, the good news that he preached, the gospel that he secured with his death and his resurrection, that is a surety. There's no doubt about it for everyone who believes. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, the next verse. And ye are complete in him. Again, present tense. It's not the future. You will be complete in him, hopefully someday. No, it's you are complete in him. It's finished. It's done. It's a present and continuous reality, which is the head of all principality and power. 
There's nothing and no one who can take it away. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, there is no doubt. He is Lord and he is Savior and you belong to him. Colossians 3 verse 4 sheds more light on this. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You will appear with him in glory. No doubt about it. Oh, how glorious it is, the resurrection. Have you trusted in Christ for salvation? The invitation is open. I'm quoting it right from the Bible. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved. Shall be saved. No doubt about it. The second certainty. Not only is there no doubt, there's no more estrangement. No more estrangement. There are few things, if anything, more painful than a broken relationship. A broken relationship between the best of friends who had a falling out and now are the worst of enemies. A broken relationship in the home between a husband and wife or between a child and parents. Broken relationships, they are very painful. And our relationship with God was broken by our sin. But praise God, Jesus removed the, the estrangement. He removed the estrangement that we might be reconciled to God. And more than that, also reconciled to one another. For the next verse, Colossians 2.11 says, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now that may sound like a lot of circumcision mumbo jumbo, but it isn't. It's a, a very important fact about restored relationships. Before the resurrection, us and them reigned. There were the Jewish people, and then there were them, the Gentiles, like me and many of you. But after Christ, after his death and his resurrection, there's no more us and them. Now there's only we. Colossians 3 verses 10 and 11 helps us to understand. This is speaking of believers. So if you put your trust in Christ, this is about you and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and is in all. There's no more us and them. It's removed. It's just being brothers and sisters. It's being Christians. It's being his children. The estrangement is ended. And because it is ended, our behavior should be different. It should reflect this reality that there's no doubt and there's no estrangement. And it's described in Colossians 3, 12 to 15. Follow along. Think about this. Are these your characteristics now? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Are those the words you would use to describe your relationships? Mercy, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, forgiving one another, striving for peace with one another? That's the way relationships are meant to be, and they can be because Jesus is risen from the dead and he's put away all estrangement. Number three, 
because of the resurrection, there's no more death. There's no more death. Medical science is working feverish, feverishly to come up with a cure or, or an immunization for COVID-19. And I hope that they succeed. But even if they do succeed, that will not end death. People might be cured of the coronavirus, but no one is cured from death. We might extend a person's life a year, five years, 10 years, but no one extends a person's life forever. That's beyond the scope of medical science, but it's not beyond our risen Lord. Jesus Christ is raised, and because he is raised, we have the hope, the certainty of no more death, we will be raised with him. Colossians 2 verse 12, continuing in our text, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Resurrection. Medical science might be able to extend life, but resurrection makes life eternal. Which one would you rather have? We need resurrection, don't we? There's really no choice to it. We need resurrection. My grandfather lived to be 101 years old. He couldn't drive, he couldn't run, he couldn't see, he couldn't hear. He couldn't use the toilet without assistance. It wasn't much of a life. But I'll tell you what kept my grandfather going. What kept him going was a certainty of the resurrection and there's no more death in Jesus Christ. And when at last he closed his eyes here on earth, he opened them in heaven. No more death. There's also no more sin. No more sin. This is number four, certainty. Are you a sinner? Well, of course you are, and I am too. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that's a certainty of a different sort, isn't it? That we are sinners. You don't have to teach a little child how to sin. They come by that naturally because they have a sin nature. They, they naturally are selfish. They naturally back chat. They naturally get their pride hurt. We're born in sin. But what's the solution? The solution is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ takes our sin away. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, continuing in our text. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. God forgives and removes our sin from us. In Psalm 103, we're told as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And so he has. What a wonderful truth and certainty this is that he forgives and he removes and we have no more sin. Now this not only means that we have a secure standing with God, but it also means that we have the ability as believers to say no to temptation. We have the ability not to sin. And that's why Colossians 3 verses 5 to 8 gives a commandment followed by a catalog of sins. If you know Christ is your Savior, you can say no to each of these sins. Listen, mortify. That means put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And then here's the list. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, that is, unbelievers, in the which ye also walk some time, when ye lived in them, that is before your, conver your conversion, if you are converted. But now ye also put off all these. That's a command. Put these off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. 
If you know Christ as your Savior, you have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of atonement and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have the ability to say no to sin. So are you doing it? Are you saying no to sin? Are you saying no to fornication? Are you saying no to covetousness? Are you saying no to anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your mouth? Are you saying no to those things or are you indulging in those despite the fact that Christ has destroyed it all? Now I understand that when we come to Christ for salvation, we begin that process of sanctification. We have to grow as Christians. We're not born mature. And that process will last our entire earthly life and we will not reach absolute perfection. We won't until we meet the Lord and he makes us perfect. Nevertheless, we should be on the upward trend. We should be saying no to more sins and more sins and more sins and more sins as we mature in Christ. But if the trajectory of your Christian life is a flat line, there's something wrong. Because Jesus Christ, by his res resurrection, gives us this certainty, no more sin. So go and sin no more. We come to the fifth certainty, no more guilt. There's no more guilt. Now, sometimes, despite our best intentions, we still fall short, and we are keenly aware of our inadequacy. You might be the kind of person who tries to please everyone, and you quickly discover that's impossible. There's no way you can please everyone. But when you let someone down, you feel guilty about that and you beat yourself up and you're in turmoil about it. It's been said that guilt is a place where religion and psychology meet. There are so many people who are living a miserable life because they are carrying a load of guilt. That perhaps is the number one reason, underlying reason, why people go and seek counseling and it's a good thing to seek counseling and I hope that if you ever do you will seek it from a biblical counselor who understands from God's Word what the truth is but when people go for counseling they, they may feel depressed they may feel lonely they may feel grief or anxiety they may be indulging and trapped in addictions their marriage might be in turmoil but often underlying all of that is unresolved guilt, but it doesn't have to be. Because of the resurrection of Christ, there is no more guilt. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Verse 14, look at the strong word. It starts with blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Blotting it out, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it, to his cross. What did Jesus do with your guilt? He nailed it to the cross where it is forever fixed and it cannot escape. The guilt that we feel is a guilt that is implanted by the evil one who wants us to be weighed down by something that Jesus has taken away. So give it up. Give the guilt over to the Lord and let it stay there at the cross. We come to the sixth certainty. Number six, there's no more tyranny. No more tyranny. The evil one, the devil, speaking of him, the resurrection of Christ ripped the teeth right out of his bite and it spells his ultimate destruction. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He spoiled the principalities and the powers that's a euphemism for, for, for Satan and his demons. He spoiled them, and he made a show, a public spectacle of them, and he triumphed over them in it. Therefore, Satan has no more dominion over the Christian, over the believer. Yes, he will tempt and he will oppose, but he cannot defeat you by the power of God 
you can and you must stand. We're given this assurance in 1 John, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is no more tyranny, no more tyranny. And lastly, there's no more fear. There's no more fear. The resurrection of Christ accomplishes so much, doesn't it? All these certainties, no more doubt, no more estrangement, no more death, no more sin, no more guilt, no more tyranny. Wipe those out. And what else do you have? What is there to fear? There's nothing to fear. There is no fear. And so we read from our text, Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so don't let others get to you. Don't have fear of what people think of you. Don't have fear of what the devil might do to you. Don't have fear of anything because this is the new reality. The new reality is Christ, and it is unshakable. The body they may kill, Martin Luther wrote, God's truth abideth still, and he will win the victory, and he does. I want you to picture this. Suppose that you are all alone with your preschool children, and you, it's late at night, and you, you hear something in the dark, in the house, there's an intruder in the house. And you get your torch and you go to investigate. And when you investigate, you find that there's this little mouse that has come into your house. Does that strike fear in you? Now, I know for some mice they're kind of gross. But, but I, is the mouse really going to be able to hurt you? No, you're so much bigger than the mouse. You're so much stronger than the mouse. You'll take care of that mouse. You, you'll kill him. Uh, and, and you won't have any difficulty doing so. You might have trouble catching the thing. But once you catch it, you'll have no trouble disposing of this mouse. That is not a threat. I want you to understand that the difference in power when we're talking about the house of God is infinitely greater. God's house is the universe. And yes, there's an intruder who enters and who even desecrates from time to time. Many times we see him walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we may, humanly speaking, be on the brink of terror. We have those instincts still within us. But let faith overwhelm the fear, for we need not fear because God has already met him in combat at the cross, and Jesus Christ is the victor. It is finished. And so this is the message of Resurrection Sunday. This certainty, the most fearsome of enemies, has already been overpowered by our God, and he cannot stand against God's children. And so by the resurrection of Christ, will you grasp this new reality? The reality that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. A reality that can be summed up in a single word, and that word is hope. Will you hold on to hope? This certainty of no more doubt, no more estrangement, no more death, sin, guilt, tyranny, or fear this certainty that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is with us, that Jesus is coming again, and we who have trusted in him will live forever in glory. Now, as I close on this Resurrection Sunday, I want to repeat to you that invitation from God's word. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If your soul is in turmoil over guilt, over sin, over tyranny, over the fear of death, then won't you let it go? Won't you 
put your trust in Jesus Christ today, call on his name to save you. And if you have already called on his name, won't you walk in this new reality, the reality of your risen Lord? Won't you put off the deeds of the flesh and a sinfulness? Won't you say no to sin? And won't you say yes to Jesus Christ to stand boldly, to be his ambassador, to tell his good news, and to obey him in your life? This is a simple choice for us to make. The certainty is all taken care of in Christ. The only uncertainty is what will you do with Jesus? Our Father, help us to make the right choice. Help us to follow Christ and count whatever cost there may be as just small in comparison to eternity. Our Father, we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. May that be true, not just from our lips, but even more so in our life. We ask in his name, amen. Happy Resurrection Day, friend. I pray that you will be complete in the Lord and that you will have a wonderful day today and holiday tomorrow and that you'll make the most of it uh, despite having to be isolated. Be sure of this one thing, you are not isolated from God. God is with you and every delight that is in him is fully accessible today. May God bless you.